afternoon. My name is Cara Melmid and I will be sharing with you my CBI today. Let's go take a look. Today I'll be talking to you about the pathophysiology of celiac disease. I hope even though it's on YouTube it'll still be easy to digest. As a brief overview of celiac sprue, I just wanted to mention that sprue is a primary intestinal malabsorption with steatorrhea, which is fat indigestion. There's a strong association with, the two, with two HLA haplotypes, DQ2 and DQ8. The interaction of alcohol-soluble gliadin in wheat, barley, and rye products with the mucosa of the small intestine is crucial to the pathogenesis of celiac sprue. Gliadin is a complex mixture of proline and glutamine-rich polypeptides obtained by alcohol extraction of wheat gluten and can produce symptoms and histological changes in the small intestine when administered to patients with asymptomatic celiac sprue. Anti-gliadin antibodies can frequently be identified in untreated patients. Damage to the intestinal mucosa is seen with the presentation of gluten-derived peptide gliadin consisting of 33 amino acids by the HLA molecules to helper T cells. Helper T cells mediate the inflammatory response. Tissue transglutin Excuse me, tissue transglutaminase deaminates gliadin upon exposure into a negatively charged protein, increasing its immunogenicity. Immune system, the immune system cross reacts with small bowel tissue, causing a reaction that leads to villus atrophy in the small intestine. This blunting of intestinal villi and the lengthening of intestinal crypts characterize mucosal lesions in untreated celiac sprue. This allows more lymphocytes to infiltrate the epithelium. These lymphocytes go into the lamina propina. The destruction of the absorptive surface of the intestine leads to a maldigestive and malabsorption syndrome. Genetics play an important role in celiac sprue. The incidence of celiac disease in relatives of patients with celiac disease is significantly higher than in the general population. As I mentioned, the gliadin binds to the HLA-DQ, which is common, or HLA-DQ8, which is less common, heterodimers. These heterodimers are present on the surface of antigen-presenting cells in the lamina propina, and binding of the gliadin leads to expression of the pro-inflammatory cytokine interferon gamma and activation of CD4 T lymphocytes. The receptors formed by these genes bind gliadin more tightly than other forms of the antigen-presenting receptors. Therefore, these genetic forms of the receptor are more likely to activate T lymphocytes and initiate the autoimmune process. The top figure shows the result of the deamidation, re deamidation re reaction in which a glutamate residue is formed by cleavage of the epsilon amino group of a glutamine side chain. The bottom figure shows gluten reactive CD4 T helper cells become activated upon recognition by a TCR of gluten peptides presented by HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8 protein molecules on the surface of antigen presenting cells in the lamina propina. Immune mechanisms. Interaction of gliadin with the mucosa of the small intestine is crucial to the pathogenesis of celiac disease. The relative pathogenic importance of humoral versus the established role of the cellular immunity in the pathogenesis of celiac disease is still uncertain. Innate responses to gliadin are perhaps even necessary to trigger the gliadin-specific T-cell response in genetically predisposed individuals. This may be why we saw our, in our patient only displaying symptoms after the attack by the mononucleosis virus. Negatively charged deaminated gliadin has been shown to induce interleukin-15 in enteric epithelial cells, stimulating proliferation of natural killer cells and intraepithelial lymphocytes to markers for natural killer T lymphocytes. Another example is that IgA antibodies to smooth muscle endomyosin and tissue transglutaminase are used commonly for serological diagnosis of celiac disease. However, 3 to 5 percent of patients with celiac disease are IgA deficient. Determining total IgA prior to antibody testing is suggested in patients. Cell-mediated immune responses are also important for the pathogenesis of celiac sprue, as demonstrated by the presence of large numbers of CD8 T lymphocytes in the intestinal epithelium. Activation of the immune system. Gluten is degraded by the gastrointestinal enzymes into a 33 mer peptide, gliadin. The 33 mer peptide is absorbed across the small bowel epithelium to the subepithelial layer in the lamina propina. Tissue transglutaminase deaminates this peptide, and the deaminated peptides are processed by antigen-presenting cells to three epitopes that, epitopes that bind the HLA-DQ2 or DQ8 molecules. The T-cell receptor and T-cells then cross-reacts with the HLA molecule, leading to the initiation of an autoreactive immune response with subsequent activation of B-cells, CD4-TH1 cells, and natural killer cells. 
The resulting pro-inflammatory environment results in further immune activation and migration of lymphocytes. And this results in the characteristic pathological finding of increased intraepithelial lymphocytes and villus atrophy. Anti-transglutaminase antibodies to the enzyme transglutaminase are found in an overwhelming majority of cases. Here's a close-up of the gliadin receptor. Anti-gliadin antibodies are found in, in patients with celiac disease. The gliadin receptors on the intestinal epithelial cells may mediate the transport of gliadin peptides to the lamina propria, as I mentioned, and, pre and they're present where they're presented in conjunction with HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8 cell surface antigens by APCs, which are probably dendritic cells. They're presented to sensitized T cells expressing the alpha-beta cell receptor. Tissue transglutaminase deaminates gliadin peptides, generating acidic, negatively charged residues of glutamic acid from neutral glutam glut glutam <laughs> glutamines. Because negatively charged residues are preferred in certain positions, such as 4, 6, and 7 of the antigen binding group of the HLA-DQ2, deaminated gliadin elicits a stronger T cell response. Prolamins. These are the majority of the proteins in food responsible for the immune reaction in celiac disease. These are storage proteins rich in proline and glutamine that dissolve in alcohols and are resistant to proteases and peptidases of the gut. One region of alpha gliadin stimulates enterocytes to allow larger molecules around the sealant between the cells. Disruption of tight junctions allows the larger peptides to enter circulation. This is leaky gut. Here you can see an illustration of deaminated alpha-2 gliadins, 33 mer amino acids, 56 to, 58 to 88, showing the overlapping of three varieties of T-cell epitopes. Membrane leaking permits peptides of gliadin that simulate to the two levels of immune response that I spoke about, the innate response and the adaptive response. One protease-resistant peptide from an alpha gliadin contains a region that stimulates lymphocytes and results in the release of interleukin-15, resulting in the innate response. The strongest adaptive response to gliadin is directed toward an alpha-2 gliadin of 33 amino acids in length. This response to the 33 mer occurs in most celiacs who have the DQ2. Once deaminated by intestinal transglutaminase, it has a high density of overlapping T-cell epitopes, which, as I said, increases the likelihood that the DQ2 isoform will bind and stay bound to peptide when recognized by T-cells. The consequence of inflammatory damage is steatorrhea, malabsorption, lactose intolerance, and villus atrophy. This figure shows how gluten peptides can enter behind the brush border membrane cells, and this may explain how, generally, larger peptides can enter the gluten-sensitive gut. The inflammatory process mediated by the T cells has led to a disruption of the structure and function of the small bowel's mucosal lining and causes the malabsorption as it impairs the body's ability to absorb nutrients, minerals, and fat-soluble vitamins such as A, D, E, and K from food. Lactose intolerance may be present because there is less bowel surface and less production of lactase, but this will get better once the overall conditions of celiac disease is treated. Alternative causes of tissue damage have been proposed by which the, the release of the interleukin-15 and activation of the innate immune system triggers the killing of enterocytes by lymphocytes. The next slide shows an example of this villus atrophy. Here's the biopsy of the small intestine. The celiac disease is manifest by blunting of the villi, crypt hyperplasia, and lymphocyte infiltration of the crypts. In the bottom, you can see that in the upper jejunal mucosal immunopathology, the schematic of the MARSH classification. MARSH stage 0 is normal mucosa. Stage 1 is increased number of intraepithelial lymphocytes. Stage 2 is the proliferation of the crypts. Stage 3 is partial or complete villus atrophy, and stage 4 is hypoplasia of the small bowel architecture. Celiac disease and inflammatory bowel are not related. They are merely two diseases that sometimes cross the same path. Ce celiac disease was found to be more prevalent in patients with ulcerative colitis than in those with Crohn's disease. major difference between them all is that the location in the digestive tract where each disease is commonly found. You can usually find celiac in the proximal sound, small bowel. Crohn's will usually affect the terminal ileum, and ulcerative colitis is going to be restricted to the colon and rectum. They also are going to affect different parts of the epithelial lining. The similar incidence in, of antibodies in inflammatory bowel disease in celiac groups suggests absorption of dietary antigens secondary to an increased mucosal permeability. However, humoral immunity to things such as maize, for example, is probably unimportant in the pathogenesis of Crohn's disease. They do share similarities, such as common genes and chromosomal regions showing up in recent research, as well as the mutual history of iron deficient anemia. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, you can email me at cara.melnid at gmail.com. Thanks.